in the next two lectures, we're going to derive the projection matrices that we're providing in the mv.js uh, package. Uh, these matrices do exactly what was done in the old fixed function pipeline, but they don't operate on the actual data. They just form the matrix, and uh, you can use that matrix any way you like, either in the application or by sending it uh, to the uh, to the shoe, probably to the vertex shader. Uh, so we're following that pipeline, but keep in mind that WebGL doesn't provide any of this. It just says, give me data and clip coordinates out from your vertex shader, and then I'm going to rasterize that, those data and send it on to the fragment shader. So I've broken this up into two parts, uh, the orthogonal uh, projection matrices in, in this short lecture, and then the perspective projection matrices in, in the next. Uh, all of this material is in the is in the book, uh, perhaps in a little more detail. But at least we can get some idea of how we can form these matrices and perhaps uh, uh, form other types of projections uh, later. Okay, so these are going to be the standard orthogonal projections, the one we talked about, a, a, a multi-view orthographic, um, a oblique uh, at the end, uh, axiometric in the middle. Uh, we'll see that it's basically the same thing. Uh, we're just going to have one function uh, ortho, uh, which does the standard ones, except for the oblique. It does all of the, the orthogonal ones, and I'll show you how to add obliqueness uh, to that. And the basic concept we're going to use here, and we're going to use for perspective matrices, uh, is this idea of projection normalization. Uh, the idea being that uh, if I can do one projection well and efficiently and implement it in the pipeline, uh, I don't want to have a bunch of other kinds of projections, so I can uh, do some sort of distortion on the parameters or effectively uh, distort the objects so that the distorted objects using used with this standard projection will give me what I really want. Because we're not going to see the distorted objects. So this projection normalization idea is very, very powerful. It also affects um, other things that in the implementation uh, further down the pipeline, in particular clipping. It makes clipping very, very simple to do. So we're going to do that starting with the very simplest uh, orthogonal projection, which we had before, which just says uh, uh, starting with uh, anything inside this uh, box, uh, standard box from minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 to 1, 1, 1, uh, I just project straight forward by effectively just setting all the z's equal to 0, and that's what I'm going to convert all the other uh, transformations into. Okay, here's the picture that we're going to follow. This is the same picture that you would have seen if you were using the fixed function pipeline, but we're, as we've said uh, multiple times, we're going to emulate this in our development of viewing. So we're going to apply a model view transformation. That transformation, remember, was to position the, the objects relative to the camera or the camera relative uh, to the objects. That part we've talked about. We don't really need to, to, to talk any more about that, uh, but we, we're talking now about the projection transformation. Now, projections, as we, we, we've said from the beginning, uh, they lose a degree of freedom because everything along a projector projects into the same point. But as we showed in a couple of lectures ago, that if we're going to try and preserve everything uh, without losing that, that uh, degree of freedom, uh, because we want to use it later when we do hidden surface removal. So we do a little trick. So instead of setting z's equal to 0, we just leave the z's alone in orthogonal. Uh, projections. So we're working in 4D, so the model view matrix is in four dimensions. The projection matrix is a 4x4. Four four. At some point, we're going to do a perspective division uh, to get us down to 3D, and that's really, you know, matters if, if remember, we saw in the last lecture that uh, if we're doing perspective, the W component can be changed from 1, so we have to divide by the W to get back to X, Y, and Z in the three dimensional space. Then we can do clipping. Now, we can actually, if you look at how things are done, you can either clip first and then do the perspective division or do the perspective division and then clip. That, that really is not a, a big issue. Uh, and finally, at the end, when we've done all of this and we've done hidden surface removal, uh, which I probably could have put in a little box after, after clipping, we finally uh, carry out 
uh, the, the, the projection which converts from 3D to 2D, but that's a trivial projection. That's simply saying at this point now we've done hidden surface removal, so I can simply remove the Z, uh, the Z component, and that's when I go to, to screen coordinates. So to sort of summarize that is we really want to stay in four-dimensional homogeneous coordinates as long as we possibly can and work with non-singular matrices so that we can preserve the Z depth relationships between uh, different fragments finally. Uh, and we'll assume that initially all of these matrices are identity matrices, that when we create a matrix in nb.js, it, it will, if you just create it bar mat4 something, uh, mat4, we'll, it'll just be an identity matrix for now. Okay, and we want to do a normalization. So what you really call the trivial final projection keep x, keep y, keep uh, uh, set z equal to zero is going to be put off as long as possible. Okay, so let's get to the normalization. So here's our function ortho, uh, left, right, top, bottom, near, near and far. Again, rem remember that near and far are measured from the uh, viewer to the uh, near plane and the far plane. So uh, since the camera by default is pointing in the negative z direction. In terms of the coordinates in that frame, the when we're looking at that, a z is going into the into the screen here. Uh, this corner is left bottom minus near, and this corner up here is is right top minus far. And what I want to do is map them into a, a cube. This is the cube in clip coordinates that will uh, that will be the rasterizer is expecting to see. Uh, meaning that everything outside of this is, is going to be clipped out. So if I want to keep everything in here, I want what is the functions that are going to map this uh, parallel pipe, right parallel pipe it into this cube. And again, here we have the same issue that, that, that one is going to be over here in the positive z direction and minus one is, is over here. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, there's going to be two steps. One is I, I want to move there's obviously going to be a scaling somewhere in here to scale it to this size, and there's probably going to have to be some sort of a translation because the origin over here in, in clip coordinates is might not be the origin over here or the center, let's say the center of this box. So in other words, a better way to say it probably is I want to move the center of this right parallel pipe it over to, the, to 0, 0, 0 over here. So there's a translation and there's going to be a scaling. No rotation is needed for, for an orthogonal view. Well, that's uh, pretty straightforward, actually. If you say, well, how do I move the origin to the center? What I can do is take the average of the left and the right side, divide by two. That's the center here in the, in the x direction. Do the same thing in the y and z direction, and simply do a translation by minus that amount. So the, here's our little translation here in terms of the three translation par parameters. It's, and the, the lack of the minus sign here is because of this uh, way that we measure distances for near and far. So we said this will center it, and we want to do that first. Now that I've done that, the scaling is actually fairly easy. Uh, if I look at what I want to do, I want to get something that has, uh, let's look at the x direction. It's something that has a length right minus left uh, to have a length of 2 going from minus 1 to 1. So the scale factor is, is right here. It's simply 2 over left minus right. For the y direction, it's 2 over top minus bottom. And for z, it's 2 over near minus far. So I have the two matrices I want. See, so here's another example of, of wanting to uh, use uh, a couple of simple matrices that we understand really well, a simple scale with a fixed point of the origin and a simple translation, and build the matrix we want out of those simpler matrices. So the final matrix for doing this projection normalization is just uh, S times T, and when you multiply that out and you look in any of the standard OpenGL references back in the, in the back, you'll find uh, this matrix, and you'll find it in, in your book. And, so here it is. It's a, it's a simple homogeneous coordinate matrix. Uh, since we're doing working uh, with orthogonal matrices, the W doesn't get, uh, get changed, and, and this is what we want. You can program that in, or you just look at the code we're giving you. If you look at the 
code for ortho, that's what you're going to see. Okay, now remember again that the, the final projection is going to now just say, I can throw away the Z now. I'm going to keep that for a while, do hidden surface removal. At the end when I project, I'm going to apply what's really an orthogonal project, a trivial orthogonal projection matrix. Keep X, keep Y, throw away Z, keep W, and eventually we'll uh, It'll go through perspective normalization, even though this is a one, because we're going to be using the same pipeline to do both uh, perspective and orthogonal uh, transformations. So if you want to say what is the final general or uh, orthogonal matrix transformation for any uh, axiometric or multi-view orthographic projection, it's this orthogonal matrix multiplying the result of what we, of what we just did. Now, what we're missing here is obliqueness. This doesn't cover oblique views, uh, and I'll give you a, a way of handling that. And the standard old OpenGL fixed function pipeline did not have, did not support directly oblique uh, projections. In fact, uh, oblique we're going to show just use it add shear to what we're doing, and the shear matrix wasn't the one of the standard forms they supported. They supported rotation, translation, and scaling. Uh, but as we saw, the oblique matrix is fairly simple. And there's a, an exercise in, that in the book somewhere that says derive the oblique uh, matrix from just rotations, translations, and scalings. It's a neat little exercise. Anyhow, how do we do an oblique projection? Well, in OpenGL, uh, they can't, you know, as I just was saying, that the, you can't produce things that look like this, but I can do the following. When I first looked at this, when we talked about the classical views, I said it looks like what you've done is, in this case, is pull the front and the back apart by pulling them the, the front to the left and the back uh, to the right. Well, that's a shearing operation. So I could say that uh, the way we'll, we can look at an uh, oblique transformation is to say an oblique uh, projection is shear the, the objects first, then do an orthogonal projection on them. So, you know, think about that here. Suppose this really were a cube. And if I looked at it with an orthogonal view, all I would see straight on, all I would see would be this front face. But if I sheared it first like, by pulling the right and the left apart, in fact, I've actually pulled the bottom down and the back up so I could see these two sides, now, if I did an orthogonal projection on that, this is what I would get. Uh, so an oblique projection, I could say, okay, shear the objects, then do an orthogonal uh, projection. And that's what you see in this uh, next slide, uh, uh, that these, uh, there's a direction of projection because it's orthogonal. Here's, here's an object, and what I'm going to do, it's going to be projected uh, obliquely onto this onto the projection plane, which we can assume is, is z equals 0 here. Here's a little better view. If you do a top view, so here you're looking at z coming down, and you're looking at this x-axis, here's the obliqueness. You're, you're projecting this x, z point into xp and the point on the, on the x-axis, for uh, so it's xp0. Uh, and likewise, if you look at the, at the top or the side view, it would look something something like this. If you look at a side view, looking from the right side here, you'd see the y and the z, and you'd see the, the obliqueness here and get the other equation. If you put that into, into a matrix, it's just the shear matrix with uh, the two directions of shear included, so it looks, uh, it looks like this. It's got the cotangents of the two angles here, and otherwise x, y, and z. Uh, x minus, uh, this is the first one is x minus uh, cotangent theta times z, and this is y minus cotangent phi plus uh, times z. Uh, and that's the projection. So if I just do this shearing first, followed by an orthogonal projection, I'm going to get a sh get a oblique transform, a oblique projection. If you, this is the simplest case, if you want to do it uh, including what we had before, where the uh, clipping volume uh, is determined by not just the minus one ones, and this is determined by left, right, top, bottom, near, and far. You're going to do a translation, a scaling, and then that final trivial uh, projection. So it would look something like this. The interface to it and how you specify those points 
in real life might be is a little more complex. I talk a little bit about that uh, in the notes, but just you know the the, the crucial point here is this uh, is this view that what we're doing is here's the object I shear it and then I do an orthogonal projection onto this plane. Believe me, it may, diagram isn't great, but uh, this is supposed to be hitting this orthogonally, and that's exactly the same as if I had done this done this uh, uh, sh uh, oblique projection from scratch. Now, one of the advantages of this uh, is is in clipping, because if you really look at it this way and say, you know, if I look at the trigonometry and I say, what were the, the number of operations you had to do to just do it directly? versus the number of operations you had to do to do it first with the shear and then and then the orthogonal projection. Turns out it comes out to be the same and, and of course you have the advantage that you're using the same uh, the same pipeline. But the real winner here is that you get something else for free and that's that the clipping becomes much simpler. And you know we'll talk about clipping later in more detail when we talk about implementation, but I think it's pretty easy to see why you get that advantage in this next slide. So here's what we were doing. Here was our object, and I was here's the direction of projection. And we could assume the clipping plane is 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 just this this is a top view. And let's assume that the that the clipping plane is here at, at this would be uh, z uh, no this would be uh, y equals zero here uh, from the top view. And all I'm doing is projecting or obliquely into that plane. Now look at the clipping issue. The clipping issue is First of all, you know, we haven't been, been, been talked about that, so let me spend a minute on that, is how do we describe for an oblique view what the clipping volume is? You know, in principle, I could make these sides, which in 3D would be just facets, would be planes, uh, or, or, yeah, or planar polygons, but they're oblique. And if I had them going in arbitrary directions, I really couldn't do this very well in hardware. And so the, the, what turns out to, to, to work very well, as we'll see, is to say that when you're doing an oblique view, the, clip, the clipping volume has sides parallel to the direction of projection. That really simplifies things, uh, both in specification and in carrying it out, as we'll, as we'll see in, in a minute. In fact, the older OpenGLs allowed you to have, I'm not sure if WebGL allows that or not, to, to in addition have a couple of arbitrary extra clipping planes. So if you really wanted to have some different clipping, but they were done in software. And if you did it in software, it just tremendously slowed down the pipeline. Doing it this way by having this, the, the, the front and back clipping planes parallel to the projection plane and the sides of the clipping volume uh, be uh, parallel to the direction of projection really simplifies things because of the following. When I shear the object in order, when I do my nor normalization, I'm distorting it so that the, its orthogonal projection comes out right. And you can sort of see that here. If I project in this direction, this point will come out here and this one will come out a little bit to the left of it. If I do an orthogonal projection on the distorted object, this one comes straight down and this point back here, which was directly behind it, but in the oblique projection, would have come out to the left. Now comes out. Sorry if it had a little glitch. Uh, so this point on the left here, when I project it or, uh, orthogonally now, uh, comes out on the left over here. So uh, that works. But look at what's happened to the sides. That's the point here. When I, uh, when I take the planes that determine the sides, and I also uh, to store them, what happens? They now become uh, perpendicular to the projection plane. And that's an enormous advantage when you try and do clipping. Because if you try to do clipping over here, what would happen? I'd take a, a, a point on the object, and I'd have to decide whether this is a plane now. I'm just looking at the top view. I'd have to decide whether that point was to the left or the right of that plane. That would involve uh, simple but a lot of floating point multiplications and additions, uh, which can slow you down. Look what happens in this case. When I've gone to this normalized volume, all I have to do is check in the top view here whether my point, a vertex, is to the left or the right of minus 1, and whether it's to the left or the right of, of x equals 1, likewise for z and the y value. So the clipping problem becomes essentially trivial. 
And it's just, a, you know, it's just a subtraction to find out if that's true. And so you get that added benefit by the, normaliza by the normalization. So the two things you get out of that is you get to use the same pipeline for all of your projections, and that we're going to do in hardware with our, with our shaders now. And the clipping problem becomes much, much easier. So now we're going to turn and look at perspective projections.